seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death, the ways of death. to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, the ways of death. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness, all I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness, all I Take the word of God with me, if you would, please, and go to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy in chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Begin reading verse 1 in just a minute. Some declare that in America, Patrick Henry did more to pave the way for freedom and liberty in our country than any other man in history. You hear him as you feel the passion and, and fire, his devotion for his people as you listen to him speak at the Virginia Convention, March 23rd, 1775. He says, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Leonard Ravenhill in his book, Why Revival Tarries, and I quote, he says, The fearful bondage and slavery that exists in the world today and threatens the rest of mankind is no fairy story. Though communism may conquer the world, terrible and unimaginable as that might be, to the true child of God there's a greater horror, eternity for the unrepentant in an endless hell. Perhaps we should get near Patrick Henry's language this way. Is life's span so dear? And are home comforts so engrossing as to be purchased with my unfaithfulness and dry-eyed prayerlessness? At the final bar of God shall the perishing millions accuse me of materialism coated with a few scripture verses? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me revival in my soul and in my church and in my nation, or give me death. <laughs> I like it. As I mentioned earlier, a writer of old said, much of our praying is like the boy who rings the doorbell, but then runs away before the door is opened. Of this we are sure as we think of the word of God and what we find the great prayer promises that the greatest undiscovered area in the resources of our God is the place of prayer. My soul asks what thou wilt. Thou canst not be too bold. Since his own blood for thee he spilt, what else can he withhold? Romans 8.32 reminds us, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. All things. And I want to tell you here tonight, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, He didn't spare His own Son. He gave 
Jesus Christ, the great intercessor, he gave his blood on Calvary. And what a work it was in salvation. And truly, and now he intercedes for us as the blood of Jesus covers sin. And he wants you to be saved. He wants you to have your sins forgiven. He wants to be that payment for your sin. If we recognize our sin, repent of that. Recognizing our lost condition, headed to hell without Christ and he wants us to know him. The love of Jesus was shed on Calvary as he showed his great love for us. He says, whosoever will may come. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Of course, that's the greatest prayer ever prayed, that prayer of salvation. If you don't know Jesus tonight, that's what he desires for you, to know him as your Savior. He gave his own son. He didn't spare his own son. But that's just the beginning, that first prayer of salvation. God desires for us to commune with Him, to walk with Him in a relationship with Him that would bring Him great joy, that would bring us into the Christian walk that He desired us to have, communing with God and walking in fellowship, a prayer that never ends, praying without ceasing, He commands. Think of that. See, prayer is as vast as God because He is behind it. Prayer is as mighty as God because he has committed himself to answer it. He call unto me. What does he say? And I will answer thee. At the judgment seat, the most embarrassing thing the believer will face will be the smallness of his praying. Quite a thought from a man of God of the past. See, we need to pray for revival in our hearts again. We need to pray for revival of self our own hearts. You, me, we need to pray for that. We need to pray for revival in our family again, in our homes again, in our churches again, in America again, in our world again. I think of a home where a boy, nine or ten years old, is saying, I don't want to come to church. It's boring. I'm not interested in that. How a revival needs to take place in a home. How a mother needs to cry. A father needs to plead. A parents need to help them to see why God has commanded us to love Him. Why church is so important. Why it's so wonderful because of what we know of our God from church. This is happening right here around us. Donald Trump in the last election, our president ran on the slogan of make America great again. He said, we're going to win again. I'm tired of losing in this nation. We're going to have better jobs. We're going to have better trade agreements. We're going to have more money. Be stronger in military, stronger in our economy. In the primary, that he was not my choice. I believed and felt it was a play on the greed of our society, the play on the love of money. We're going to have more money if you elect me. More money again. Materialism. We're going to have so much money, he would say, as if that would make America great again. Money. Or help our nation in any way, as a matter of fact. Money. Materialism. See, if money is the goal, money never brings anything but problems. Now, money can be used for great things, but if money's the goal, the love of money is the root of all evil. And so if, if money is the goal, if economy is the goal, if greatness is the goal for greatness' sake, it only brings a snare. See? Make America great again must be a, pro, a byproduct, not a goal. We're going to see that in this message in just a minute. But America is not great as the goal. It has to only be a byproduct. What do we need? I thought of this as I was even planning out this year. I wrote this on this date, or this Sunday. I was going to preach, and the Lord didn't allow me this morning to think of that thought. But as Christians, what did you want Trump to do for you? I am grateful for some of the positive changes in our nation. Grateful for some of the freedoms that have been allowed again, not so much restriction of regulation. I'm grateful 
uh, for uh, just some of the common sense conservative principles that have been allowed to move things along. And we've seen that in our economy and building, even building right around here and things going up. And, and, and I'm grateful for just common sense, conservative, biblical principle things, allowing free market and, and uh, some of those things. I'm grateful for some of those things that have happened. But as a Christian, as we think of the spiritual realm, what has changed for you? What did you want Trump to do for you? If we're not careful, sometimes in an election year we pray and seek God's face and Lord, oh, we cannot have Hillary, maybe you might have thought. I'm not trying to tell you what to, how to vote or what you did. I don't, I don't know your, your thinking on everybody, but I know the agenda on the left I could not go along with as a Christian with what they stand for and believe. But many Christians were praying. I believe the Lord answered our prayer and, and, and gave us more time to have revival. I believe he granted us more time by allowing us not to go further down the track of liberalism that we were headed from the previous administration. But spiritually, what has changed for you as a result of Trump's election? If we're not careful as Christians, sometimes it's the end of the election, and if it goes our way, we can whew, exhale. Huh, back to business as usual. But as Christians and in churches, business as usual is what has got us to the place that we're at. Business as usual meaning we check the box of attended church, check the box of read our Bible today, check the box of had our moments of prayer. And our life as a whole is ours and our plan and our career and our goals and our vacation and our retirement and just things that don't line up with what Jesus had in mind when he said, follow me. You want to be my disciple? Take up your cross. Take up this thing that meant death. If you saw someone walking with a cross in God's day, in Jesus' day when he walked the earth, that means they were headed to die. He said, take up your cross. You see the imagery? I'm headed to death to self. Death to my plans. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. This is what the Lord has in mind in a Christian life. Deuteronomy chapter 11, we're going to read together. I'd like you to follow along as we read. Let the Lord speak to you. This is a nation coming into the promised land. God giving them great promises for future of what he wanted to do with Israel. And I believe, as we found in the Psalms, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, that they limited the Holy One of Israel because of their unbelief, their disobedience. But this is what God had in mind. The greatness of God would be shown to this nation. Deuteronomy 11, verse 1, it says, Therefore, shalt thou, therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep His charge, and His statutes, and His judgments, and His commandments alway. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children which have not known, and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, His greatness, His mighty hand, and His stretched out arm, and His miracles, and His acts. Think of that. His greatness, His mighty hand, His stretched out arm, His miracles, His acts, which He did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land. And what He did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses and their chariots, how He made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you. And how the Lord hath destroyed them unto this day. And what he did unto you in the wilderness until ye came into this place. And what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the sons of Reuben. How the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their households and their tents. And all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. He said, I'm not talking to your children that didn't see this in verse 2. But I'm speaking to the ones whose eyes saw it. Your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. Oh, how we could talk about our nation. You could go back through the history of our nation, you that love history and have studied from the war for independence, from even the uh, days of the, of the pilgrims 
coming over and, and how God sustained them and God's mercy on them as they could have all died and should have all died, we see in some of these settlements and how God prepared these different uh, things and even some of the Indians, how God used them to help and on and on as this Indian man walks out of the bush speaking uh, perfect English and all the story behind him and just different things you see all the way through God's hand working the Revolutionary War the war for independence what God did and and they should have lost the British were greater and stronger but God was his hand was in it there's no doubt about that people were praying uh, General George Washington was a man of prayer I mean these people were men of uh, biblical principles and the women the same and they worshiped the Lord and were wanting freedom of religion to serve their God. And on and on we see from history all the way through our, the wars, even in the world wars, and God's hand of protection all the way through because of America's belief in this book and that God was the one that they trusted in. Not in might, but in the Lord. Not in their armies, but in their God. Verse 8. Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day. That ye may be strong and go in and possess the land where you go to possess it. Now we understand this chapter speaking of Israel. But we can make the application. No nation beside Israel has ever been blessed like America has been blessed. Verse 9, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which the Lord sware to your fathers to give unto them and their seed a land that floweth with milk and honey. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out where the sow, thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it, it's a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. Think of it. From the beginning of the year, even in the end of the year, and it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, that I'll give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain, the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, and thy wine, and thine oil. And I'll send grass in thy fields for the cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived. And ye turn aside... And serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven that there be no rain. And that the land yield not her fruit. And lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart. And in your soul. And bind them for a sign upon your hand. That they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the door posts of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied. And the days of your children, the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. Where did people get this idea to put Ten Commandments out on these places? You heard of the guy that ran into the Ten Commandments again. They made that big thing and he ran his car into it a second time. He's hit a, a different place, but this broke them up. Where did they get that idea to put them out like that in a public place? Interesting, huh? Right here. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you. And ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall be your coast, shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon as he has said unto you. We've seen that in our nation. God has blessed us. People, as he says, that possess, you shall possess, verse 23, greater nations and mightier than yourselves. You could make application in world wars that there were nations that could have and people could have argued were mightier, but we had God that they did not have. Verse 25, there shall no man be able to stand before you. 
The Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land. You can see the application. You shall tread upon as he has said unto you. Verse 26. Here's where I want to get to. This is the principle to take out of it. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day, to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal, are, there not on the other, are they not on the other side of Jordan by the way where the sun goeth down the land of the Canaanites which dwell in the champagne uh, over against Gilgal beside the plains of Morah? For ye shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set you before you this day. Interesting about the mounts, Mount Gerizim, the blessing and the curse upon Mount Ebal. If you want to know more about that, you can read chapter 27, 28 of this book. And the tribes that he put on Mount Ebal and the tribes he put on Mount Gerizim. Pretty interesting. There was a natural amphitheater, the valley between, and they would rehearse these commandments of God in that land one day. But I want you to see the principle, and this is a principle that runs true in your life, in my life, in your family, in my family, in our nation, in our church. He says, I place before you today. Verse 26, a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. And so there's no doubt, as you think about that slogan, make America great again, America was great because they obeyed. And now as we see God's judgment it's because we're disobeying. It's just that simple. It's a principle that runs for your life, our homes, our nation. And I bring you the title of the message, Make America Godly Again. Bringing back to obedience again. Lord, help us now as we look in your word. Lord, speak to us in these few moments now as we glean what you'd have us to. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Their eyes saw it, we mentioned. We can see that in our history. Obedience brings God's blessing. Disobedience brings God's curse. In their nation, it was constantly the struggle of going back to idolatry. And he mentions that in verse 28, to go after other gods, which you have not known. That's part of the Ten Commandments, and the reason is it's all of our nature. It's mankind's nature to go back to idolatry. And idolatry is just simply putting anything in God's place, whether it's your work, whether it's your family, whether it's whatever good thing you might think is a good thing. Nothing can take God's place. The emphasis of life and money and prestige, position, whatever the case, this was their propensity, and it certainly runs true in mankind all across the board. Psalm 33, verse 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You say, this is talking about Israel. Well, we can take that principle from Psalm 33, 12, can't we? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that's been our nation that way. And the people whom he had chosen for his own inheritance. French writer Alexis de Tocqueville, after visiting America in 1831, said, I sought for the greatness of the United States in her commodious harbors, her ample rivers, her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for it in her rich mines, her vast world commerce, her public school system, and her institutions of higher learning, and it was not there. He said, I sought for this greatness of the United States. I looked for it in her democratic congress, her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America, heard her pulpits flame with righteousness, did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. He says here, America is great because America is good. Hillary Clinton in one of the debates quoted some from that same piece. 
But I ask you, what made America good? America's great, they, he says there, because America is good, or was good. What made America good? You see, the Bible says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There's none good but God. Now, he was God, but he was one to know what they, what do you say? Who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. See, Tocqueville here says America is great because America is good. But I say to you, America was good because America was godly. See, godliness, simple definition, is just simply godlikeness. Christ in you. A death to self, as we think of Christ liveth in me, Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. See, I'm not good, and you're not good. The Bible says time and time again, there is none good. We've all gone our own way. We all, in his sight, are wicked. On and on, he tells us, read through the Psalms, read through uh, certainly the book of Romans, other places. He says, there's none good. None that seek after God. See, only God is good. You see, there's none good, so only as America and Americans were saved and filled with the Spirit of God so godly could it have been good and in turn great. So again, it all points back to us as Christians being filled with the Spirit of God, getting the gospel to people so they in turn can be filled with the Spirit of God. And as they are godly, then they can be good as the Lord Jesus has goodness, the fill, fullness of the Spirit. Goodness comes out. You bump someone filled with the Spirit and love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, bumps out. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God has filled them. And so the only way we could be good is by that. And the only way then we would be great, as Tocqueville put it, is because of our goodness that comes from godliness. America will not be changed by politics. Not Trump, not President Cruz, or whoever you might have been voting for. No, President Reagan, not going to happen. It will not be changed by politics, by persuasion, uh, by pressures. It will be changed by the power of the Spirit of God speaking to individual hearts as we present them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the hope for America. As we conclude tonight, we need to pray. We need to get serious about giving our days of our lives and the hours of our days to prayer, to the ministry of the gospel, giving the gospel to people. This is what will make people godly when they trust Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God moves in. And this is what will cause people to show goodness and what will make America great again. But again, that can't be the goal. America being great was a byproduct of America obeying God's word. He said, I lay before you today a blessing and a curse. Your choice. I want to read you two things and I'll be through. We need to pray for Canada. We need to pray for Germany. Germany passed same-sex marriage in their nation. This past week, you may have read about that. But Canada passed this bill, and this is on the cusp of our land. This is the confusion that all this transgender stuff is causing. And the confusion is not yet known. The state of confusion is putting homes and families and individuals. Listen to Bill 89 of Canada. This is already passed in Canada. It's, the name of it is Supporting Children, Youth, and Families Act, 2017. It was approved on June 1st by a vote of 63 to 23. 
The Minister of Children and Youth Services, Michael Coteau, who introduced the bill, said earlier this year that a parent's failure to recognize and support a child's gender self-identification is a form of child abuse. And a child in these circumstances should be removed from the situation and placed into protection. So as the schools pump out this garbage of you have to choose your gender, and according to Facebook now, according to um, the uh, Christian that's, that, that's on Fox News, um, I can't think of his name right now. No, he's an independent Baptist, actually. Uh, he's Todd Starnes. He's on Fox News all the time. They interview him, but he puts out good articles. He's actually was a bus kid, believe it or not. Pretty interesting. He worked on the bus routes. But anyway, he says there's now, according to Facebook, 58 different genders. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I, I can't get there. But just because you say someone can transgender doesn't mean it's a real thing. But here's, here's now laws coming out to say if a parent tries to teach the Bible's what the Bible says that there is male and female. Well, isn't that simple? Don't you like the simplicity in Christ? There's male and female. And says that this, you're a boy, and I want to help you to become a godly man. And over here, you're a young lady, and I want to help you to become a godly woman. And you're abusing your child. You're not allowing them to be self-aware and self-identification, as this goes on to say. Let me just read it. Support a child's gender self-identification is a form of child abuse if a parent fails to recognize and support a child's gender self-identification. A child in these circumstances should be removed from the situation and placed into protection. The religious faith in which the parents are raising the child present in former laws has been removed from consideration for assessing the child's best interest. The former law stated that the parent of a child in care has the right quote in the law, to direct the child's education and religious upbringing. The new law has removed that consideration. So the parent has not a right to teach their child, is what they're saying. As God commands here in Deuteronomy, we just read verse 19, and ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, you teach them these things that are to be first in your heart, you're to teach your children. They're making laws saying you cannot. You send them to the public schools and they're teaching all this garbage and you sit them down and say, that's garbage. You can't pick these different genders and identify as this gender and some other time. He says, that's, uh, that's child abuse. And they can be removed from your home. If that's found out. This is where we're headed. This is the track we're on. We're not far behind. If our liberal, progressive, as they want to call it, Agenda continues to move along. This is where the confusion leads. You just, whatever, and there's no, it's just. I read you another article, and we're done. Faith destroyed in a religion class. And Chase gave me this. This is by Kyle Austin. He's one that leads Collegians for Christ. He's actually a graduate of Crown, but these Collegians for Christ are in even colleges here in Alabama, similar to Teens for Christ and what, Lord willing, we may be able to even get into University of Montevallo doing something similar to this. It's a Bible club, but basically in a university or UAB, some of these places that are near us. The story goes, just the other day I was speaking with someone who was burdened about the effects college had on a young person they knew. Talking about our secular universities and colleges. Here was yet another young person who was faithful to church through childhood, but became a casualty in college. A student responded that the professor of the world religion class had showed her the truth about life. She realized that she did not need grandma and grandpa's Bible anymore. It was irrelevant for our day and time. This is in a world religion class. And that this professor had showed her the truth. Here on a college campus in America, a professor in the religion department destroyed the faith of a student. How backwards is that, the article says. In this class, the young lady's faith was brought into the crosshairs of a battle much bigger than we could ever imagine. Again, it's a battle for the minds of our young people. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 
We know this is happening. We've even had Christian movies made about it not too long ago about this in college classrooms. But they are targeting, going after, and attempting, and, and, and if any, any way possible to destroy the faith. We've had children that left here, went to University of Alabama. You all would know that we're here from years past. Levi, and after a few semesters in University of Alabama, he said, I'm an atheist. From this church. What, would have, what could have made the difference in this student's life, the article goes on to say, to keep her from becoming a casualty? What could have made the difference? She needed to be equipped to defend her faith. She needed to know what she believed from the Word of God and why she believed it and where to find it at in the Bible. She needed to be trained and equipped to defend her faith before she walked onto a college campus. These young people are going to need that. Parents... Pastors, youth pastors must see the detriment that can come and begin introducing apologetics into their teaching, preaching, and curriculum. Youth group must not be just a social club to entertain youth. It must be a training ground, discipleship, fishermen's club, things like this, to equip young people to face the battle for their minds. The world has many logical reasons why people should believe their way, so we must have the same amount of logical reasons, if not more, from the Word of God. Apologetics is a necessary tool to fight with in the battle of reaching college students for Christ. I was told by the chair of the religion department at one university that the department was comprised of professors from complete atheist. This is the religion department. From complete atheist to some who were considered born-again Christians. That's very concerning. Knowing this, we must also help students understand that just because they are taking a religious class or even a class on Christianity, it does not guarantee that the professor will be a believer and that the class will be taught from a truthful perspective and a correct worldview. Now, lots of thoughts and things could be said about this. I certainly uh, would recommend people to go to a Christian college and on and on we could talk about why, and the, what our universities desire to do, why our public schools are doing what they're trying to do, why we have Christian school here and promoting Christian education because the battle is always fought in the mind. Well, that's where we be, every sin begins in our mind. So we first see and we desire, we think, and then we act. And lust is conceived, the Bible says it brings forth sin. See? And so the battles for the mind, the Bible scripture they just gave in that article, we can see that there. And that's why, what an opportunity to invest in young people like a vacation Bible school, uh, like our Christian day school, like... Uh, even what we've had going to here at our summer adventure camp in the summer, seeing young people saved that are in public school during the week, during the school year. But this is why we must get back to our knees in prayer. This is why we need to pick up kids and teenagers and so on on vans and buses. And uh, we, as a church, need to be interested in get them getting discipled and trained and grounded and no longer be able to be tossed to and fro by some professor, but can stand because they know this book and know why they believe what they say they believe. See, generations have come and gone, and we've failed to teach them this book. We've entertained in the church. We've talked about God and Jesus, but they don't know why they believe it. They just have always believed it. They've not been anchored to the word of God taught and preached. One-on-one -on -one discipleship and training. We must get back to our knees in prayer. We must get back to our Bibles and back to our teaching our children. We have to have, back to having spiritual sons and daughters that we're reaching, that we've led to Christ and now we're training, discipling them in the faith. We reach them through soul winning efforts. We need to get back to discipling those we've won to Christ. We must make America godly again if it ever is going to be great again the goal isn't to be great the goal is to be godly obedient to the Lord that's what made America great let's bow in prayer